I started to look at these preparations that I was making with different species, but in the beginning a lot with frog embryos in a different way. And I started to look and begin to see the forms for what they were, just forms, and the aesthetic value instead of looking at these subjects for their value as documents. And that's a very important difference between a document and a piece of art. But I think there's a tremendous difference between the two. Um, in science, we collect documents, especially in biology. The documents show, show data. So embryonic landscapes came from that, an aesthetic evaluation or a reading or a way of seeing of these amazing forms, these developing embryos that are extraordinarily beautiful in themselves as well as for whatever they tell us about life and science and cells. I try to work very hard on, on really sort of, as somebody described in a, a sort of a garden of forms in which one can linger. So then I had to work on biophilia, and biophilia was sort of this pretty hard and difficult task that I set myself against in a way, which is that I wanted to be able to do something like that with what everybody has seen, with a genre that everybody knows, and with a subject that has been uh, the focus of many, many artists throughout art history, and that's the still life. So biophilia is taking the classical still life and saying, okay, now I'm going to take things that everybody knows, or you can find anywhere in the street, at home, a flower, a, a feather, a seed, a, a teapot, and I'm going to try to view it differently. With the idea is that, that you never see the entire object, but your mind reconstructs around. In biophilia, there's very little of the object is being photographed in actual focus. And the rest is sort of uh, these beautiful, the diffuse areas that, that your brain quickly uh, constructs. But in fact, you're seeing very little in focus. Identity is a problem or an issue that interests me enormously. And now in this genomic, if we can call it like that era, it seems that we're always constantly looking for another way to identify oneself and the other. How would this idea that DNA contains some information that makes us unique impact on us. And that's how I started to think about genome and identity. And there I use, for some of the images, like Homo sapiens, use the iconic ladders of DNA fragments used in Sanger sequencing, which I think students don't even know anymore. So I use that iconic image to try to play with the meaning of that as portraiture. And in some cases I have full figures, some cases I have just faces. In other cases I use the position of tissues to inquire about where, where might be the identifiable person. Is it the skin, is it the muscles, is it the low, is it the bones, etc. Uh, in another case I use uh, boxes of Eppendorf's, which scientists of course start laughing right away because it's simply where we keep samples. But in fact the collection of Eppendorf's contain DNA. I developed the idea that it might be a genome, is the genome some of the parts or is it more, etc. So, People that haven't seen boxes of Eppendorf actually have said all kinds of amusing things about them. From that I started to think, okay, so what if I view some of these work that I've created in the past in this sense, and then my focus would go straight to the boundaries. And I began to work on what eventually became minimal landscapes. And minimal landscapes really derive from this meditation about where the meaning in a landscape is. It's minimal because I put all the attention in the very essence of what I think the meaning is, which is the boundaries. They become pure black, and all the grays disappear. The grayscale is condensed. And yet, I wanted to portray this idea that the very essence of division contains the seed of change. And when viewed from far away, they look like very stark, clean, black and white, everybody calls them paintings, jewelry photographs and they're static in the sense that the boundaries are static and the images, the archipelagos of black forms in a white background may indeed be very dynamic, but, but each boundary is static. But as one gets closer to them, one begins to see that the boundaries are far from static, that they are porous, and one begins to see that these dots or lines, whatever they are in black, they don't have a sharp boundary. In fact, they're highly diffused in terms of how the white and the black mix. 
And that's how I try to portray this idea of change, this idea of freedom, uh, of movement, of uh, progress, if we want to call it that way, or change at least. Thank you.